we're ready. Good afternoon and welcome to Ethanol Producer Magazine's webinar series. My name is Lisa Gibson. I'm the editor of Ethanol Producer Magazine and I'll also be moderating today's webinar titled Co-Generation for the Ethanol Industry, Optimizing Plant Efficiency and Reliability Through Innovative Solutions. This webinar is sponsored by Siemens. Before we begin, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Siemens is a global technology powerhouse that has stood for engineering excellence, innovation, quality, reliability, and internationality for 170 years. The company is active around the globe, focusing on the areas of electrification, automation, and digitalization. One of the world's largest producers of energy efficient resource saving technology, Siemens is a leading supplier of efficient power generation and power transmission solutions, and a pioneer in infrastructure solutions, as well as automation, drive, and software solutions for industry. With its publicly listed subsidiary, Siemens Healthineers AG, the company is also a leading provider of medical imaging equipment, such as computed tomography and magnetic resonance imaging systems, and a leader in laboratory diagnostics, as well as clinical IT. In fiscal 2017, which ended on September 30th, 2017, Siemens generated revenue of 83 billion euros and a net income of 6.2 billion euros. At the end of September 2017, the company had around 377,000 employees worldwide. Further information is available on the internet at www.siemens.com. Thank you to Siemens for sponsoring today. I'd like to run through a few details before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to find that under the events tab at ethanolproducer.com, so check for that in the next week or so. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar after our speakers have delivered their presentations. Feel free to enter a question into the designated text box on your screen at any point during the webinar. If you'd like your question direct directed to a specific speaker, please indicate that. Any questions we don't have time for will be forwarded to the speaker so they can still address all inquiries that come in today. With that, I think we're ready to begin. We have two main presenters today, Samuel Muffet, who's the Regional Sales Manager for Siemens, and Michael Welch, who's the Industry Marketing Manager for Siemens. But they'll also be drawing on the expertise of additional speakers who will contribute to the presentations as well as field questions during the Q&A. They are Michael Cormier, who is the Director of Sales and an expert on gas turbines, John Graham, who is the Applications Engineer and an expert on steam turbines, Rich Shimaleski, Marketing Manager and expert on distributed control systems, and Stanley Dorasami, Senior Global Vertical Manager and an expert on ethanol, sugar, chemicals, and fibers. Our first speaker is Samuel Muffet. So, Samuel, go ahead and begin when you're ready. Thanks, Lisa, and uh, thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, so, as mentioned, my name is Sam Muffet. Um, I work in the Siemens Power and Gas Division based out of Houston, Texas. Here's a, an agenda of what we're going to go through today. I'm going to start off by giving a quick overview of combined heat and power, explaining exactly what it is. Um, then we're going to go through the array of Siemens products that we provide for the ethanol industry, focusing specifically on gas and steam turbine products. I'll then pass on to my colleague, Michael Welch, who will discuss how ethanol is made um, go through some alternative fuel examples and then provide some examples of projects which use them. And then I will finish things up with a, a screening analysis. This is essentially an ec economic analysis you can do to understand if CHP makes sense for you. And then we'll summarize things before having Q&A. So why should you install combined heat and power? Essentially, it, it saves you money. Um, it saves you money because it's an efficiency improvement, which means you save fuel for a given energy output. In addition to that, 
because you are reducing the amount of fuel burn, you're also reducing your emissions. Now, in certain parts of the world, for example, the US, if you sell your ethanol to California, for example, um, you can actually further boost your revenue because CHP reduces your carbon intensity, which means that your ethanol is worth more money. So for those of you who aren't familiar with combined heat and power, um, just to give you a quick overview, it essentially means combining um, the method of generating electricity with how you generate your thermal power. So you'd have a fuel source. Now this could be natural gas, propane, lamp or gas, coal, which is used to turn a prime mover. Um, that prime mover would turn your lump of copper, your generator, which would provide the electricity. And then you would use your waste heat to provide your thermal needs. Uh, that could be steam, hot water, refrigeration. Um, typically in ethanol, it's large amounts of steam. Now you're probably thinking, you know, if, if CHP provides such a great efficiency improvement, um, you know, why is it so important today? So the grid is very much evolving. In the past, you'd have very large power plants which would provide electricity, and then your thermal needs would be generated on site. With this um, kind of traditional system, your efficiency is around 50%. If you look at today's grid, typically you've got large amounts of um, kind of centralized power along with distributed generation. Um, there's typically a lot of renewable um, that's entered into the electricity grid. Um, that's typically intermittent in nature, which means there's peaking power. Um, there's also facilities looking at microgrids, um, which is meant there's a general trend of increasing electricity prices. Now, if you can combine your electricity with your thermal production um, to form a CHP system, your efficiencies are 75% and greater. So this high efficiency means that you lower your fuel costs, you lower your emissions, um, also improves your reliability and gives you greater resiliency. There's been uh, multiple cases where the grids have shut down for various reasons, such as natural disasters, and on-site generation has continued to operate unaffected. So what this, does this all mean for the ethanol industry? So ethanol plants typically run 24-7. That means any small improvement in efficiency has a big impact on your operating costs. In addition, the plants typically require significant amounts of electricity and steam. In fact, for a uh, corn ethanol process, this is typically second only to the cost of corn. So as mentioned, the efficiency improvement going to CHP um, reduces your fuel costs, improves your emissions. And not only that, in places where there's a need for base load generation, there's a potential to team up with your utility and potentially share the cost of the power plant. Because of the efficiency improvement, um, there are government incentives available. For example, in the United States, there is currently a 10% investment tax credit which is available for CHP plants. Okay, next, um, we're gonna look at the products that Siemens can provide for the ethanol industry. So obviously today we are focusing on the steam and gas turbine products, which you can see in the fourth column. However, um, Siemens provides a wide range of other products and on the webinar today, we've got one of our experts, Rich Shimaleski from our Process and Drives group. Um, so Rich, can you provide an overview of the other products that Siemens um, provide for ethanol? Thank you, Sam. This is Rich. I wanted to thank you everyone for joining us today. Some of the aspects that we want to talk about are ways to reduce your energy before you generate more energy. Uh, so we talk about variable frequency drives, whether it be used in corn-based uh, ethanol. If we also talk about our from our uh, South American friends with Brazil, um, sugar-based ethanol. We have a lot of experience putting into the uh, process to reduce your energy consumption and run your motors more effectively. Also with power distribution, 
whether it be your low voltage or medium voltage applications, being able to have an, a coordinated distribution strategy, whether you're generating power on campus or um, taking power from the local utility, we help coordinate those strategies, as well as controlling their system, whether it be your instruments, such as your pressure, temperature, level, and flow, or your distributed control system. Siemens distributed control systems represent five billion gallons of ethanol production annually and uh, have been a part, a large part of the major OEMs such as ICM, Delta T, and uh, overseas with Katzen. So we have a large experience in the industry to help reduce your risks and help manage your costs. And we're also able to provide integrated solutions between your new energy solution as well as your main process control system so that we have an optimized operator experience. Sam, back to you. Thanks, Rich, appreciate it. So if we focus on our gas turbine product line, Siemens offer the widest range of um, gas turbine products in terms of power output. Obviously, for ethanol facilities, we're looking at the, the lower end, the smaller side of this range. However, we do have machines as large as our SUT800, which is 48 to 57 megawatts in size. Um, installed in ethanol plants, and then we've got products as small as our KG2, which is two megawatts in size at ethanol facilities. Just to give you an idea of the approximate um, power required and, and steam input needed, um, typically for a 100 million gallon per year plant, you would need around six and a quarter megawatts, and then about 160,000 uh, pounds an hour of steam. Likewise, um, Siemens has a wide range of steam turbine products. In fact, we have close to 200 steam turbines installed in the sugar and ethanol market, and our SST300 is the most common steam turbine in the industry. Uh, with Siemens acquiring Dressrand in 2015, we also added a, a further range of products, our single stage um, impulse bladed machines and, and these being a very popular design particularly in the US with um, as a letdown steam turbine um, and we've got around 50 machines installed. So now I'm going to pass on to my colleague Michael Welch to discuss how ethanol is made. Thank you Sam. Um, my name is Michael Welsh. I work for the portfolio development team. I'm based in Lincoln in the UK. So good evening to all of you who have seen my time zone. Good afternoon to the rest of you. And the controls have just decided not to work. Ah, here we go. <laughs> okay. As most of you already know, ethanol can be made from a very wide variety of biomass. Typically in the United States, it's, it's corn, while in many other countries, it's residues from sugar production as shown on this map here, using either cane or beet as the, as the source. Globally though, there's also vast resources of cellulosic material that's a, a waste from agricultural processes and the like, that could also be used to produce ethanol. And the, the aim is to produce the glucose, which you can use in the fermentation process, which is the key to everything. Now, if you're starting with a sugar syrup and molasses, then the ethanol production process starts with the fermentation phase. If you're starting with a the starch, then you need some pre-processing, and it's more most common to employ a dry milling process and an enzyme addition to convert the grain into the correct state for fermentation. This fermentation produces a biogenic CO2 off-gas that uh, requires capture or treatment before it can be emitted to atmosphere. And we'll talk a little bit later on an example of how making use of this gas as a, as a, as a fuel for, for cogeneration. Now, as the demand for ethanol grows, new wet milling processes are being utilized to maximize the yield of ethanol from cellulosic materials, such as corn stalks, grain store, straw and paper pulp. While there's new processes being introduced for fermenting woody and herbaceous biomass for ethanol production. Now, Quite a few of these types of process produce a, a sulfurous wastewater and a sludge that needs to be treated before disposal. 
and one way of treating this waste is uh, anaerobic digestion. Now, anaerobic digestion processes produce a methane-rich gas, which after you've removed the hydrogen sulfide, can be used as a fuel to fully or partially displace fossil fuels such as natural gas. Now, conventionally people, when they think of cogeneration, think of using the waste heat from the power generation portion to produce the steam required by the ethanol process. However, it's just as feasible to use wasted heat energy from the process to generate some electricity. And my colleague, John Graham, is going to talk about just such an example in the US. OK, well, thank you. And um, I'm John Graham. I'm at uh, Dresser Grand Siemens Steam Turbine Plant in Burlington, Iowa. I We're using this Arcalon Energy um, installation in Liberal, Kansas is one example of a place where a steam turbine was installed in a corn ethanol plant to uh, produce both power and heat. The, in this particular application, the plant produces 110 million gallons per year of ethanol. Uh, it, uh, produ it produces steam at 120 PSIG uh, to, for some of their process needs. And there's other process needs that they have where they use steam at atmospheric pressure. Instead of letting the steam go down from 120 PSIG to atmospheric pressure in a pressure reducing valve, uh, they let the steam go down through a steam turbine and produce 2.9 megawatts of power. This is quite an efficient process because all of the heat that's contained in the steam that goes into the turbine is either going to come out of the turbine in the form of shaft power or else uh, in the form of heat in the exhaust steam that can be used for a process. The mechanical loss and electrical losses in a turbine generator set only amount to about 5% of the power produced at the generator terminals. So this is a very efficient production of electricity. It's essentially producing electricity at a 95% efficiency. Um, and it's quite simple to install a turbine generator set. It's essentially just replacing a pressure reducing valve. As long as it can be in parallel with the utility, the utility absorbs all the power that the turbine generator set can produce, or it makes up for all the deficit of power, the additional power that the plant needs. So that's just a quick overview of this particular application. However, steam turbines have been used in many process industries and let down turbines. Uh, over the years, they can be designed for whatever pressure steam conditions the customer's process calls for. They're all custom built to suit the customer's needs. Um, I guess that's all I have, so I'm going to turn it back over to Sam. Uh, it's back to me, John. <laughs> back to you? Okay, well, thank sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we move on to the, the middle section, and we're going to talk a little bit now about alternative fuels examples. Now, as Sam mentioned earlier, with its power and heat demand, ethanol production is actually an excellent candidate for cogeneration. It's a very good match for the heat to power ratio. But when industry in general and not just ethanol producers think about cogeneration or CHP, then natural gas is the first fuel most people think of because it's widespread, it's available in many regions, it's generally a very competitive cost, especially in natural gas producing countries. And from an environmental perspective, it has the lowest carbon dioxide emissions of any fossil fuel when you burn it, and a, a low overall environmental footprint with low NOx, uh, carbon monoxide emissions, and particulate emissions. But not everywhere has secure access or even any access to natural gas. Or you may 
choose to take advantage of the lower price or an interruptible gas tariff when you allow the gas utility to shut you off for 48 or 72 days a year. Now, a cogeneration plant can operate on a, a wide variety of fuels. Around the world, diesel is a common backup fuel in case of natural gas supply interruptions, while LPG, propane, or liquefied natural gas are also alternative candidates as both a primary fuel or a backup fuel where you have supply issues. However, there's also the possibility to use opportunity fuels, such as the waste material from the production process or the off gas from the anaerobic digestion, as mentioned previously. One such possible example is shown in the diagram here, where a biomass fueled boiler and a steam turbine combination provides the power and the process heat required for the ethanol plant. Now, these opportunity fuels can either fully or partially displace your fossil fuel consumption, so that reduces your fuel bill, reduces your environmental footprint, and it can also overcome a waste disposal issue and save you costs in that way too. Now, as I mentioned again, there are new processes emerging, especially to produce ethanol from less conventional feedstocks. And we at Siemens are providing technical support for cogeneration possibilities for several companies around the world. Uh, the one illustrated here is from Bloom Distillation. They're a California-based company specializing in producing ethanol from agricultural wastes. This process, like anaerobic digestion, produces a methane-rich fuel gas that can be used as a gas turbine fuel instead of or blended with natural gas. Now, such a gas can actually be, still be used in dry low emissions combustion systems, so you still ensure emission compliance is maintained. And in some cases, it's possible to switch between the biogas produced and 100% natural gas, depending on the availability of the biogas, or any blend in between uh, without stopping the gas turbine or impacting its operability. Now, being able to use such free or low cost opportunity fuels can have a significant positive impact on the project economics as over the equipment lifetime, the dominant expenditure for a cogeneration plant, as Sam mentioned earlier, is fuel. Now, in some cases, the volume of biogas available is sufficient not only to provide the heat and power needs of the ethanol plant, but also to be able to sell electricity to other users. So an ethanol plant can become the hub of a mini or a microgrid, helping a whole locality to become energy independent or even enable a region to gain access to a secure power supply for the first time, helping the whole local economy to grow. Now, one example of a biogas fuel cogeneration plant is this one in China, Tingguan. The facility is in Nanyang, and it's currently the largest ethanol production facility in China. The biogas from anaerobic digestion has been used in place of natural gas. So it's 100% displacement of the natural gas, and it provides a significant proportion of the plant's total power and steam needs. Now, this biogas has a high CO2 content, around about 38%. So it has a roughly 55% of the energy content of natural gas, but the gas turbine is able to start on this fuel, run up and operate, and provides the same power output and the same emissions profile as a, as a natural gas fire, fired unit would. Now, I mentioned earlier that using the fermentation process produces a biogenic carbon dioxide gas. And now my Mike colleague, Mike Cormier, would now take you through a, a project where this fermentation off gas is used as a yes, thank you, turbine Rick. fuel. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mike Cormier, and I'm the director of sales for the uh, KG2 uh, gas turbine. And at Siemens, we have access to a, a new and very exciting technology. It's our KG2 gas turbine operating in an externally fired condition using a power oxidizer as a combustor. Uh, this technology allows us to run our gas turbines virtually on any waste gas stream, even with waste gas streams with energy levels as low as less than 100 BTUs per centimeter cubic foot and make electricity with NOx emissions less than one part per million with no post exhaust treatment. First two units uh, have been installed at Pacific Ethanol in California and are in the final stages of commissioning. We expect it to be finished and running uh, full time uh, by the end of August. They have currently successfully run for about a thousand hours. 
Pacific Ethanol first became interested in this technology because they were having issues with their RTO. It was not consistently meeting their permitted emissions. So they agreed to purchase two of our systems. Their waste gas stream coming from the distilling process is being diverted from the RTO direct to the power oxidizer where it, where it will be destroyed at levels less than or equal to what the RTO is currently doing. And then it's going to use that energy to make electricity and steam. In fact, the RTO was running just around 9 ppm NOx. And with this system that you see here, we're going to lower that to below 1 ppm. Now, for Pacific Ethanol, they only had enough of this waste gas stream to power about 25% of one gas turbine. So for this application, we're blending natural gas to make up the difference. Their plan in the future is to install a digester at this location, and the waste gas from the digester will also be used combined with the other gas stream and sent to the power oxidizer uh, to make power. The hope is there will be enough waste gas and digester gas to completely eliminate the need for natural gas. Uh, next slide, please. Now this slide here is interactive. We could probably move ahead a little bit. Um, but it shows that um, currently, as you can see on the right, the um, Pacific ethanol is using a regenerative thermal oxidizer to, to destroy that gas stream that's coming from the, uh, the ethanol process. And they're going to eliminate that. So it'll be in backup operation only. Um, in fact, the hope is to completely eliminate it. Uh, we're also, they're also using two steam boilers to make steam. They, they were currently producing about 115,000 pounds per hour for this facility. And that's so we're going to reduce the amount of uh, natural gas that's being used to fuel these boilers. A little further. And what that'll do is um, that uh, from the KG23G with the exhaust heat uh, through a HERSIG, we're going to be producing about 25,000 pounds per hour of steam. So they'll be reducing the amount of steam coming from their boilers and reducing the need to burn that natural gas. And you can see in the upper left there, <clears throat> they were consuming 4.2 megawatts of power and purchasing it direct, for, direct from PG&E. And with this, these two power systems, we'll be producing about three and a half megawatts of power. So they'll only be uh, required to, um, to consume or purchase about 700 kilowatts uh, from PG&E. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and I guess one, one quick point there, that little green dollar per gallon adder um, that was mentioned earlier in this presentation. In the state of California, if you, if you lower your carbon footprint or be able to reduce your emissions, you can actually charge more for the ethanol. So they're actually able to charge you know, a couple of pennies more per gallon. And when you're producing 60 million gallons per year, that can be a sizable amount of money. And here you can see a statement made by Neil Curler, the uh, CEO of Pacific Ethanol. Um, their goal was to be the most environmentally friendly ethanol plant. Um, and the great part about this technology is not only does it allow you to have less of an environmental impact, but depending on your location, this can be done while also reducing the total operating cost. So we're really looking forward to uh, finishing the commercialization and moving on to uh, other ethanol plants. Um, and that's it from my end. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. And now we hand back to Sam. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. So now I'm going to walk you through a screening analysis. Um, you're probably thinking, you know, what are the steps to go from a conceptual idea about having CHP to actually having a plant on site which is integrated with your facility? Well. The first step is to understand your current loads. Um, you can do an energy audit to see if there's any potential energy improvement. Now, um, Rich mentioned um, Siemens can provide products to reduce your existing loads. Uh, for example, if you have any fans or motors, uh, you could install VFDs on these. This not only reduces your energy cost today, but it also reduces the size of any potential on-site generation that you may install. So once you've done that, you then want to look at your existing energy loads, do a screening analysis, and I'll go on to provide an example of one of these 
uh, which we carried out at a US ethanol plant, which is producing 60 million gallons per year. Now, assuming the screening analysis is favorable and the economics look good, you then look at the project feasibility. You start to understand you know, the design, um, bring in partners which you can work with on this project, understand the fuel supply, interconnection with the grid, et cetera. You then move on to your detailed design. You'd look at the engineering, the integration of the on-site generation with your facility. Um, you then sign contracts, have a notice to proceed, and that's where the fun starts, where you actually build a plant, um, install the equipment, commission, integrate it with your facility, and then start to save money because of the efficiency improvement. So here's a um, screening level analysis that we did for a facility. Um, the first step was to look at the current electricity and natural gas usage. So for this plant, the um, electricity was provided by the local utility. It came in on a 13.8 kV line and then was distributed throughout the plant. They were having issues because um, the facility was at the end of the line and so they were having outages uh, between six to 10 times per year and then each time they were down, it was for a number of hours, which was obviously impacting the annual revenue. Um, so that was something we had to factor in with the analysis and was one of the main drivers for them looking at on-site generation. So we looked at their utility rates. Um, as you can see, they had a relatively low rate of 6.6 .6 cents per kilowatt hour. And the chart on the right-hand side shows the varying electricity consumption throughout a year. For the natural gas, um, this was coming in on a line um, two to three miles long, provided at 90 PSI. However, it could be boosted up to 250. Now, it's important to know the gas pressure because if you are to install a gas turbine, um, these can need pressures of around 300 PSI. Um, so if you have gas pressure today at that level, that prevents the need for having any gas compression system, which reduces your installed cost. And again, um, we looked at the current gas rates and the varying gas demand throughout the year. Now, one thing that we've learned from doing these analyses is that it's important not to look at a, a single snapshot in time. Um, the more data you have, um, the better you can size potential CHP equipment and understand the economics. So we typically like to see um, a year's worth of hourly data, and that can give us an excellent idea of you know, whether it makes sense for a facility to go forward with combined heat and power. So once you've understood your current energy usage, it's important to look at any future growth with your facility. Now, for this specific facility, they were planning to grow from a 60 million gallon per year plant all the way up to 120 million gallons per year. Now, given a, a new on-site facility would last for you know, 25 plus years, it's important to size it correctly for your future needs um, so you're taking into account that potential saving and not incorrectly sizing it based on um, today's needs if they're incorrect. Another thing to consider is um, going off the grid. Um, a lot of people are interested in it simply because it gives them greater control of um, their electricity. Um, however, it, it's rare that the economics make sense and it's important for you to consider uh, both options. So here we have a number of things to consider. Firstly, um, scheduled downtime. If you have a, a combined heat and power, whether it's a gas turbine or a reciprocating engine, a steam turbine, there's going to be a certain amount of scheduled maintenance that needs to be carried out annually. During that period of downtime, if you're off the grid, you need to either be comfortable with a complete plant shutdown during that time or have on-site backup generation available, which obviously adds significant 
additional expense to the overall project cost. The alternative is to have some sort of utility backup standby rate with the grid. So that's one of the initial discussions you'd want to have with your utility. And we can look into that, look into it as part of our screening analysis is how many hours you could be down per year and how much that would cost. Another thing to consider is um, the equipment sizing. As I showed you on um, the previous slides, the load can vary throughout the year. So if you are off the grid, um, you would need to design the plant for your peak loads, which means it's a more expensive plant versus um, sizing the facility for your average loads and then buying excess electricity needed from the grid. Also, similar to the scheduled maintenance, if you are to have some sort of unscheduled outage, um, some process downtime, if there's you know, a unplanned shutdown, if off the grid, you need to have backup power readily available, also auxiliary boilers um, to provide the steam versus being connected to the grid, you need to have the capability to island. Now, these are just kind of points to consider um, the main thing is understanding the economics and what makes sense. Next, um, this shows kind of preliminary layouts of your facility and where you tie in um, to the grid and where your gas is supplied. As you can see with this site, there's plenty of space. Um, so no issues there, but it's, it's worth considering early on in case there are any constraints and any unusual design may be needed and that could add additional cost to the project. So for this analysis, uh, we looked at five different options. Um, essentially, we wanted to look at four variables, different gas turbine sizes. So here we had a five and eight megawatt gas turbine being considered. We also looked at redundancy, a single machine or two machines. Obviously, two machines add additional cost. However, you've got the redundancy in case if for some reason one shuts down, you're at least providing 50% of your power. We then looked at different levels of duct firing. Typically, as I previously mentioned, uh, ethanol plants require a large amount of steam. Um, therefore, it's worth considering duct firing. Um, but then you may also want to look at a simpler solution, having no firing from the HERSIG. And then finally, um, we considered including the two megawatt uh, power oxidizer KG2 solution, uh, which uh, Mike Cormier recently went through. So for each of these, um, we came up with an approximate economic analysis um, over the life cycle of the project. And as you can see here, the um, approximate payback period was around five to seven years for each different solution. The most, um, I guess, economically beneficial solution was the eight megawatt turbine. And for that, uh, we calculated the emissions reduction to be 12,800 tons of CO2 per year. So this analysis is an excellent way if you understand if the economics of CHP makes sense for your plant. Now, not all facilities are the same. Um, you may not be able to obtain a, a favorable standby rate, which can make CHP more complicated. However, um, it, it may be a perfect solution for you. And this is something that we can provide free of charge um, to, to help you, you know, make sense if, if CHP is something that you wanna look into. So to summarize um, from the webinar today, um, obviously combined heat and power is a, an excellent opportunity for you to reduce your operating costs because of the efficiency improvement. It also reduces your emissions significantly. The recommended next step uh, would be for you to perform a, a screening analysis. And as I mentioned, this is something that Siemens can provide free of charge. Um, in that analysis, would obviously take into account any government incentives that are available, um, such as the 10% investment tax credit that's in the US today, 
Um, and we can also look at the wide range of Siemens products that are available and that we're supplying to ethanol plants today and improving their operation. So that's it from me. Um, we'll move on to Q&A. Okay, thank you, Samuel, and to all of our speakers. We do have a few questions, so we're going to jump right in um, and start reading some of the questions that have come in from our attendees. Uh, the first one here is, what amount of steam in pounds per hour goes through letdown turbine in Arcalon Energy to generate that 2.9 megawatt equivalent? Thank you. Um, I'll pass that on to John Graham. He's, he's the expert on that facility. John, can you help us there? Yes, for that particular uh, installation, it takes about 100,000 pounds per hour to produce the 2.9 megawatts. Um, other applications where there's higher inlet pressure and inlet temperature, uh, we can produce um, that much power with uh, considerably less steam flow. Thanks, John. Okay, great. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Um, what is the value of the, of the standby power that will eliminate shutdown? Okay, I can go ahead and answer that. So uh, the value of it is it essentially, I guess there's two things. Is the, the cost of it, the cost will vary depending on where your facility is. Um, some utilities can offer extremely let's say cheap standby rates, which means that they'll, they'll offer a large block of hours where you can be shut down and then they'll charge a monthly rate for that. Um, for some smaller utilities, they don't even have a, a standby rate in place um, simply because they're very small and there's no on-site generation in the region, for example, a municipality. Um, the value of having that ability is essentially you can install a plant and then always have the grid as backup if for some reason your facility your on-site generation shuts down you can instantly um, bring in power from the grid so that obviously improves the reliability of your facility thanks sam uh, next question, what is the amount of mega, what's the megawatt hour per ton of ethanol? Megawatt hour per ton of ethanol. Um, that's a good question. It's Stanley, would you be able to help with that one? Yeah, generally speaking, okay, I'm going to give you a kilowatt figure. Uh, you're looking at the U.S. has done pretty well, and some good plants in the U.S. are looking at around... 0.7 kilowatt hour per gallon of ethanol. I think that's the question, yes. Yeah. So you're looking at a consumption of about 0 0.7 kilowatt hours per gallon of ethanol. Okay. Is, is there much of a variation globally on that? Yeah, there's been, uh, of course, in the European Union, it's not corn, it's other uh, kind of products that we are using. As you earlier on said, this will also depend on the parasitic load of the plant, you know, how much of VFDs do you have? Uh, because if you're looking at your water consumption, you know, the best you can come down to is about 2.7 gallons of water per gallon of ethanol. So if you got a very high water consumption, this will push up your pumping costs and this invariably then starts to increase your kilowatt hours per gallon of ethanol. Thanks, Danny. Great, thank you. Next question, what kind of power can we expect for our investment? What kind of power can we expect from investment? So uh, I guess it, it all depends on, on how much um, you invest. I mean, the, the the larger the plant, the more expensive it will be. Um, typically, in the U.S., uh, it's it's fairly unusual for an industrial facility 
to oversize the generation and sell the excess to the grid. However, we do have ethanol plants um, which do that in Europe. Um, so it really depends on, on your power need and, and yeah, exactly what you're looking for. Great, thank you, Sam. What is the environmental impact with the implementation of CHP? M Mr. Welch, do you want to answer that? <laughs> um, because you're burning fossil fuels on your site, you will have emissions. Um, so locally, the impact might be more negative, but on a global scale or a regional scale, it will show a, a decrease in, in emissions, particularly NOx and particulates, if you're displacing coal power or something like that. And mm -hmm. on a CO2 perspective, you're, you're globally reducing the CO2 emissions, but you will increase them locally. Great, thank you. Um, next question, what are the benefits of going off the grid? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, um, there's a number of benefits for CHP in general. I guess the benefits of going off the grid is that you have you know, complete control um, in that if there's any issues um, with the electricity grid, you will not be impacted by that. Um, now, there are instances where going off the grid makes sense. Um, let's say the your local utility doesn't have a standby rate and is charging you a very high amount. Um, there, the economics can make sense to go off the grid. And you will have complete control of your plant and can control when you want to be, be on and off. Um, unlike facilities which are, let's say, connected to the grid, don't have their on-site generation, if the grid goes down, then the whole plant goes down and that will impact their, their revenue. Excellent. Um, our next question is about waste heat recovery. Um, what about using a process such as the organic Rankin cycle? Yeah, Michael, do you want to answer that? Yeah, um, that is very much a possibility. Um, there are certainly low grade you could use it. Um, we have also looked at schemes, and in fact, there's it's not an ethanol plant; it's a, a textile plant in in Europe where we are looking at a scheme that combines a gas turbine with an organic Rankin cycle and instead of a water-cooled condenser on the organic Rankin cycle we're using a, a small steam generator so you're getting steam CHP from a gas turbine and organic Rankin cycle. Yes it's a possibility and it's something we are seriously looking at and actually bidding. Great. Um... Next question, what is the time to implement implement from the notice to proceed to the end of commissioning for the CHP based on an SGT A05 or SGT 600? Sure, um, so typically the lead time on that equipment is around 12 months um, from order placement. And then you could assume, let's say a, a month for shipping and then, uh, uh, around six months for installation and commissioning. So approximately anywhere between 18 months and two years from order placement to commercial operation. Great, thank you. Um, how can we do an evaluation of our plant? So um, I'd say we can certainly help with that. So you can reach out to me. You can see my contact details on the screen right now. And we can bring in our um, development experts who can come in and, and provide an energy audit of your plant to understand if the economics make sense for you.
We have had a few questions coming in asking for specific contact information, so just uh, make note right now, Samuel Musset is the contact. If you have any other um, questions or would like to do an evaluation, his information is on the screen, so that should satisfy plenty of the questions that we've had coming in. It sounds like we have a lot of people interested. Um, next question, is financing available and what are those options? Yes, um, Siemens can offer financing. Um, we have provided it, uh, I guess, as development funding, and then we have also provided both debt and equity. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on that, so I won't go into too much detail. All I'd say is if you reach out to me, um, we can bring in our relevant experts from Siemens Financial Services um, who can talk through that with you. All right. Um, next question here is, have you ever implemented your process in any Canadian plants? It, I guess it's process. I mean, we have a, a large amount of equipment installed in Canada. Um, so yeah, we, we very much have equipment running today. Um, in terms of uh, whether we've done sort of energy audits of facilities, I'm, I'm sure that has happened. I personally have not been involved, um, but yeah, we have a lot of experience in Canada. All right. Um, is the CHP system for an ethanol plant typically superheated steam being extracted from the steam turbine, or is a smaller steam turbine that runs on saturated steam more likely? Mr. Graham, would you be able to answer that? You still on the phone, John? I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, we, we can hear you now. <laughs> okay. You know, we have built uh, many of them for ethanol plants that do run on dry and saturated inlet steam. As we get up to higher pressures, it becomes more and more important to have superheated steam. Generally, you know, we can go up to about 400 PSIG inlet pressure and still use non-superheated inlet steam. Between 400 and 600 PSIG, we can use non-superheated inlet steam, but uh, we have to use some expensive special materials. Above 600 PSIG, we do generally insist on at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit superheat. So does that answer the question? I, I think it does. I, I think it does, John. Sam, did you want to add anything else to that one? Uh, no, I, th I think we're good. Okay. I think John's covered it. Thank you. All right. Uh, I just want Great. To make Thanks, a point. John. Uh, if it's an extraction for the process, then one would rather prefer dry saturated extraction, especially if you take into the distillation column, because your superheated steam would not give you the required heat transfer. It'll do more damage on the columns than actually help you when you are taking up the ethanol purity. So on the extraction side, you'll want to go for more dry saturation with probably a degree maximum of superheat, but that's if it's going to the process. Thanks, Danny. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions that are pretty specific and complex uh, and clearly designed for a specific project, a specific plant. So I'm going to save those and forward those to our speakers um, instead. I think that it'll, it'll be more, it'll be easier for them to respond uh, via email or over the phone and talk to some people who are clearly interested in, in the costs and, and how everything applies to their own systems. But I do have a couple left that I think we can address here um, during the webinar. What are some of the expected paybacks with the implementation of CHP? Okay, so as I mentioned in the, the screening analysis, for that specific example, it was around a five to seven year payback. However, it very much depends on the cost of electricity and fuel 
that you're currently paying and will be paying in the future. So it, it's really project specific. That's why we'd recommend doing a screening analysis. And also depending on what that is, that it will also range whether you'll move forward with the project. For example, some facilities would want to see a, a very low payback period. Others, they're, they're happy to have something you know, longer than that. So I'd say it, do a screening analysis um, and that will determine the economics because it can range significantly. Thank you. A couple more questions here. Is power production linear with the pressure drop on a letdown turbine? Example, 150 to 30 versus 120 to zero. John, would you be able to answer that? Okay, I'll answer that. It's really uh, proportional to the available energy that you get uh, when you reduce steam isentropically from the inlet condition down to the exhaust pressure. So you really do need to look at steam tables, look up the enthalpy of steam at your inlet pressure and temperature, and then uh, the, at the same entropy, uh, look up the enthalpy that you have at your exhaust pressure. Uh, you subtract that uh, ideal exhaust enthalpy from your inlet enthalpy, that gives you your available enthalpy in the steam. And uh, really your uh, available power is going to be proportional to that available energy. So I, I, hope, Thanks, that answers the, I hope that answers the question, but it is, you do need to look at the steam tables to get a good answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the last question that I think we'll be able to handle via the webinar. Again, I will forward these other questions that are more technical and, and really um, project-based to our speakers afterwards. So you, uh, all of our questions that have come in from our attendees today will definitely be answered. Um, last question for now, though, is what is total installed CapEx per kilowatt for SGT 600 or SGT um, A05? So that can range significantly depending on where you are in the world. Um, obviously, construction, labor, materials, etc., will be different for different parts of the world. Um, from a US perspective, uh, you're probably looking at anywhere from sort of fourteen hundred dollars per kilowatt um, up to two thousand dollars per kilowatt again I, i'd recommend kind of it, it, it you need to know kind of project details to understand exactly what that would be because it can range significantly okay thank you sam and thank you to all of our speakers and experts that were on the panel today and of course, a big thank you again to our sponsor, Seaman. We also have a few events that are coming up next year that we'd like to make you all aware of. First, International Biomass Conference and Expo for next year will be in Savannah, Georgia. That's March 18th through the 20th. And the 2019 International Fuel Ethanol Workshop and Expo is going to be in Minneapolis, I'm sorry, Indianapolis, and that'll be June 10th through the 12th. That will be co-located again with the Advanced Biofuels Conference, and we'll have the traditional Ethanol 101 pre-conference seminar offered next year as well, and that'll be on June 10th. A big thank you again to Siemens, to our speakers, and to everyone who dialed in today. This concludes our webinar. Have a great day.